Okay, so BetPan stands for Bioengineered Palladium Nanoparticles and is a project funded within the framework of the Center of Digital Life and is a project ending summer this year. Um, this is a collaboration between two departments at the University of Oslo, Biology and Physics, or Life Sciences and Physics, um, NTMU, the biotechnology department there, um, our local technology transfer office in Ventu, who is an actual project partner and not just looking into things with us, and a company that generates high-end magnets called Yamak. And I will come back to why we need magnets in this project in a second. But I'll start with, with talking about nanoparticles. And, and you'll be wondering why we talk about biotechnology and nanoparticles. This will hopefully become clear during this thing. So nanoparticles are, compared to bulk materials, systems that have different physical and chemical properties. And there's different reasons for that. First of all, the more obvious one is that the surface to volume ratio of smaller particles is different from large bulk materials. But then on the nanoscale, with all the quantum mechanics going on there, this is why we have physics people in our consortium, the, the properties of the materials also change in, in terms of optical properties, electronic properties, even magnetic properties of the materials. Melting temperatures and other very basic principles change when you go to very small particles. So a metal, for example, that is in nanoparticle form has a lower melting temperature compared to a larger block of the same metal. Um, so you can, by miniaturizing the particles that you're generating, you can change physical and chemical properties. And potentially, you can do that in a targeted fashion. And you can do that using concepts from biotechnology. And this is what this project is all about. So currently, nanoparticles of different metals are usually produced by chemical and physical methods. And in all kinds of literatures, this is just cut out examples from there. These are usually described as, as highly you know, energy intense processes using rather toxic chemicals and leading also to relatively high cost, both because of the toxic chemicals that have to be you know, used, but especially because of the energy consumption. Um, and now when, when you look at palladium specifically and other high value precious metals, it, ha it has been known in literature for a long time that bacteria can reduce salts of these metals to form nanoparticles. And this is photos from our own lab. This is, in principle, our very primitive workflow that we're discussing here, right? You have bacteria in a buffer solution. You add a palladium salt, and you incubate this. And then what you get if you have living bacteria is you get these black nanoparticles forming inside the bacterial cells. And if you have killed the bacteria before, this process doesn't happen, suggesting that this is not just some chemical reduction reaction, but this is really mediated by live cells, right? So this has been known for many years, and this is not our invention or anything, right? So, so this works with gold salts, palladium salts, platinum salts, and, and, and many other precious or semi-precious metals. What people do only have a limited understanding of is what is the biochemical processes behind this reaction that is generally considered a side reaction of active metabolic processes in the cell. So now the slide is supposed to go forward. Uh, right now it's still. Ah, okay, yeah, I was kind of stuck. Okay, here we go. Okay. So conceptually, this is a two-step process. And that was our starting point for the project, right? There is, in principle, there's a step where the bacterial cells absorb or take up the heavy metal salts into the cells, and then there is a chemical reduction. Um, and potentially, the pathways and enzymes and proteins involved in these processes are different for these two different steps. On the right-hand side, you see what happens after the reduction process. You see these small nanoparticles spread all over the cell. And I hope you can appreciate in this picture that they have a certain size distribution. So they're not exactly uniformly sized in this early example from years ago from our work. So the project objectives of BatPen were, roughly speaking, to first and foremost figure out what are the genes and pathways that are involved in both the uptake and the reduction steps. For the reduction steps, there was already some hints in literature that general hydrogenases uh, in, in the cells would be part of this. That has been kind of known. But for the uptake, I mean, there is no palladium transporters in E. coli, right? Because palladium is not a natural mineral that is or trace element that is used by bacteria. 
So the question is, how do these things get transported? And then on the biotechnology level of this, to, to study how mutations in these genes would then affect nanoparticle production, would we get more or less particles? Would they have different sizes? And would they have different qualities as a material that could be exploited in all kinds of innovation ideas later on? And the things that we've been looking at there is catalysis, because palladium nanoparticles are efficient catalysts for many different types of chemical reactions, and also magnetism, because it has been hinted at or known that at very small nanoscale, palladium nanoparticles can become super paramagnetic or even ferromagnetic. And this is not a property that the bulk material has, but it is a property that is extremely interested in, interesting in chemical catalysis because a magnetic particle would be, for example, easy to remove from a reaction mixture, right? So, and then, sorry for the typo here, I'm just seeing that now. Uh, and then, of course, the final goal of the project was to engineer material strains that would be fine-tuned to, product, to produce efficiently tailored palladium nanoparticles with specific catalytic, magnetic, and so on properties, right? Or maybe I should take this one step back to, to show that we are able to do this, right? That we can engineer and fine tailor the particles that come out from this process. So to do this, we had to screen, right? We had to screen mutants and, and find out, you know, what are the, the pathways involved. Um, and this was some of the initial experiments. And I just want to illustrate with this slide how difficult these things can sometimes be when you think they could be easy. So what you see here is a number of mutants um, that we screened for their properties to reduce palladium salts to palladium nanoparticles. And for the strains where this is a clear yes or no, this is relatively obvious, right? There's a few that cannot do it anymore. And of course, the enzymes or transporters relevant under these conditions can then be identified to some extent. What you can maybe also appreciate here is that there's a lot of, you know, not black and white, but kind of gray zone results here. So there's a lot of things where the intensity of this blackness is, you know, different. But we had to figure out the hard way that this cannot be used in a plate reader. So we cannot automate this in any way, right? The white ones we can find, everything else has massive error bars and cannot be identified except for you know, manual inspection. And that's not the best way of you know, automating a large screen. So this has been an approach that has led us only so far. It gave us a few of the obvious hits, let's just say. But um, for screening larger mutant collections and then finding more enzymes and pathways involved, this wasn't really good. So, so then we had to turn to a different approach. And the approach that we decided to take was to look at you know, what, what genes are being massively regulated when you add the toxic uh, heavy metal salts, like palladium salts, to the cells. And then look at these mutants that we find there as uh, in more detail. Um, so what we did, what did was a general palladium challenge of, of E. coli cells and just to look at what, what is being regulated massively under these responses and to figure out what in these you know, long hit lists of genes that have a response to palladium stress, what of these are potentially relevant for the process we're looking at. And, and to no surprise, this is published work and you can look it up, right? Um, of course, there was a lot of genes regulated that belong to general stress responses in E. coli cells and these would be regulated also by other toxic heavy metals. But then there were some specific ion transporters that we found there that are relevant to our work because we are looking at import and export of metals. Some transcription factors, that's probably again more general, but and then there was also regulation, up and down regulation of certain amino acid synthesis pathways where we're still struggling to understand what that does to our system. And now it's kind of locked again, here we go. So this is where we are right now, right? We have mutants where we have differences in palladium uptake into the cell. So on the top, you see mutants with random numbers. I'm not giving you gene names here. And, and there's a lot of 111 is the wild type E. coli that we're using. Um, so the one to the very left. And what you see is that a lot of strains, a lot of mutants have the same capacity for uptake of palladium salts, but there's a few that take up palladium much less efficiently, it seems, right? And then on the bottom, line, you, you see a catalytic reaction. Um, and there you see that even if the uptake of some of these strains is the same, and they take up palladium equally efficiently, the catalytic capacity of the nanoparticles that you get out 
is then not always the same, suggesting that the, pro the palladium particles may have different catalytic properties at the same amount of palladium, which is highly relevant to us. And if you look at strain 846 here, th there's a bit of a problem with the errors. I'll not go into detail here, but this one does take up less palladium that gives us the best of the catalysts, right? So, so something is happening there that is really highly interesting to us. And just to explain, the blue and the gray bars are just measuring the quantity of palladium with two different independent methods. And so, so if these bars are significantly different, then we have a bit of a problem with, with our errors here. And this is EDX electron microscopy just to prove to you that the particles that we're getting are indeed palladium particles. So this is a specific palladium signal that we're seeing here. And on the, the four pictures on the left that you see here is a situation corresponding to the wild type where most of the particles are formed on the surface of the cell in the kind of extracellular matrix of the cell. And then on the right-hand side, we see that the strain on the right-hand side has the particles mostly inside the cells and that they are on average much smaller. But everything in pink here is palladium. So yeah, so the particles in that case are inside and smaller. And this is the one strain that I showed you earlier has also the highest catalytic activity in our test reaction that we're using here. This is not the same strain, but just to show you briefly that also this magnetic concept works. I'm not going to explain in, in much detail, but on the top, you, you see why we're working with Giamark here, because the company produces these very massively strong static magnets. And then what we can do is we can use our E. coli suspensions that have produced the nanoparticles and just check if the particles are being pulled towards the sides of the tubes, suggesting that the particles are indeed magnetic. And on the top right in this picture, you see that there is actually a magnetic moment to this that we can measure. And at the bottom, we, we show magnetic force microscopy just to show that where the contrast is, is the magnetism and that this is then directly where the cells are. So this is not happening outside of the cells. This is really directly related to what's inside the cells. And last but not least, we have taken first steps to show that we can actually purify these nanoparticle materials from the bacterial cells for potential industrial uses. And this just shows very preliminary experiments with different purification protocols. And what this is, is Fourier transform infrared spectra that show the presence or absence of biomaterials still stuck to the particulate material. And you can see that, for example, purification protocol E on top has almost no organic material left on the particles, while some of the other protocols still have significant amounts of organic material stuck to the particles. And at the bottom are the control samples that have not been treated. So as our project is now finishing, we have been thinking very hard how to take this to the next level. And, and there are some pitfalls and problems here, but also great perspectives, we think. And we're currently preparing an RCN proposal in that regard. Um, we would like to take this to industrial scale. So we want to show that, that we can produce these particles not just in a test tube format or in half a liter formats, but this can, that this can be taken to hundreds of liters. And this is not super trivial because scaling this to larger volumes gives you changes in oxygen levels and other things that would impact redox reactions in the cell. Of course, we want to improve our catalytic properties further and improve the strains further in that regard. Um, that's kind of obvious. And we need to work on these purification protocols. Um, and, and, then, and then the key problem that we've been facing during the BedPan project is, is to indeed find industrial partners that find this interesting enough to work with us at this stage. And I think this is a huge underestimated challenge. Maybe this is something for, for Kim to pass on to people. I don't know. Um, that when you develop frontline new ideas and materials, as we hope we do here, it is not always obvious what is the best industrial use, right? The best practice use for these things. And there might be cases where you come from a point where you have an industrial problem that you want to solve with a specific enzyme or reaction. But if you generate an interesting new material with new properties that haven't been observed before, such as you know miniature magnetism of palladium particles, um, you go to industry and you tell them, now we have this, and they say, oh, what should we use it for, right? Like, it's it's not always that obvious. And, and this has been one of the challenges is in this project is to get in contact with industry for these kind of brainstorming things 
to find out, you know, how should we, what, what, what are, is the properties that we should develop further? What is the things we should focus on within our project? And this whole RRI thing, this, you know, making innovation, not just for the sake of itself, but for making this into something really useful that will then be an, in the end used in large scale industrial project processes has been a problem in this specific project. And if you know of any company that might have an interest in catalytic reactions mediated by metal particles, don't have to be palladium, I would be hugely interested in getting new contacts there.